a little housekeeping. I want to make sure that all the CPYBs have signed in on the sheet outside the door. So um, one thing that I did, I, I'm not good at ad-libbing, but I'm a hell of a writer. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, a special, a special aviator is an understatement to describe our keynote speaker today. Richard McSpadden is a senior vice president of the Aircraft Owner and Pilots Association's Air Safety Institute. He was originally appointed to the position as executive director in 2017. He's a native of Panama City, Florida, and graduated with a degree in economics from the University of Georgia. He holds a master in public administration from Troy University, but the coolest educational benchmark in my mind is that he is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Air War College, after which he served 20 years in the U.S. Air Force. Um, this service to our country included the prestigious role of commander and flight leader of the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds. During his tenure, Richard personally climbed in the cockpit and led well over 100 flight show demonstrations flying the lead aircraft. <clears throat> These days, he leads a highly professional team at the Air Safety Institute who analyze av aviation accidents and apply the resulting data into real-world educational lessons for pilots, which in turn greatly enhances the safety of the flying public. The Air Safety Institute's findings are published across all major social media platforms and are viewed over 12 million times per year. I'm proud to say that I have flown with him. And without further delay, let's give a warm welcome to Richard McSpadden. Hey, nice to see you. Thanks for the nice introduction. Well, good afternoon. So I want to ask you, if you were to take a group of people and you were to ask them to, um, to exaggerate their performance, to expand their capabilities, to take a little more risk and push the envelope a little bit, what would your expectation be on their performance and specifically the record of their mishaps, accidents, problems, issues? Could you actually ask people to take on more risk, expand their capability, and not have more mishaps that would cause problems for the organization. That's what I want to chat with you about today, because in essence, that was the charge of the Air Force Thunderbirds, and that's what we did. Our job was to go out and demonstrate the Air Force, the pride, the precision, and the power of the United States Air Force. We would fly it lower than anyone in the Air Force, faster, closer together, doing aerobatic maneuvers, and yet there was no tolerance to add more risk to the Air Force environment. So that's the question uh, and the topic that I want to chat with you about uh, today. <clears throat> and the only reason, or the only way you can really do that is you've got to get really comfortable pushing the boundaries. And by pushing the boundaries, I mean, I just put up a few examples here. I spent some time in the IT industry after I left the Air Force. I served as a, um, as a uh, senior director in an IT organization, a Global 50, uh, Fortune 50 IT organization. And I ran an outfit that we did about 150 million a year in revenue. And so some of what I learned in the Thunderbirds, we were applying to the industry that, that uh, I joined. is a company called EDS, you might have heard of them. And so our, our task there was to figure out how we're gonna push the boundaries and gain more contracts. But of course, if you do that the wrong way, you push the boundaries on your financials, then now you're finding yourself in big trouble you know, in terms of your financial performance. And an example of how we would do that is we, we, would, we would bid on these contracts that would go for 10 years and they'd be well into the billions of dollars. And the only way you could make money on these contracts is in the long term, in years four, five, and six, the latter half of the contract, you had to lean into technology that wasn't yet proven. You had to say, we'll figure out a technology or we'll take this prototype and we'll operationalize it so that in years four, five, and six, this actually becomes profitable. That was always an interesting conversation with our CFO. And so we got pretty good at it, but who got even better at it were all our defense contractors that would go up against us and we would compete against. What those guys would do is they would bid contracts well underneath what we would, well underwater to make the contract, but they would make assumptions on the part of the government to uphold their part of the contract. 
They knew their client well enough to know that there was no way the government would be able to uphold their part of the contract. And as soon as they filed the first time, it was cause for a rewrite, and they would end up charging the government way more than we did in our initial bid. And they went contract after contract. You want to talk about pushing the boundaries in a financial sense. So being able to push whatever boundaries are out there, because in the center of that diagram that I showed up, that in the center there is um, irrelevance. I worked for EDS, and after a while, EDS got bought by HP. And part of the reason was we became irrelevant in a service industry that we started. EDS started the IT services industry with Ross Perot and eventually would be bought out and dismembered because we became irrelevant. We weren't willing to push the boundaries far enough to see where the next frontier was. And it's the only way for exceptional performance. There's a lot in the industry now, a lot of talk about elite performance. How do you get there? The only way to do it is you've got to figure out how to push these boundaries without going outside the red circle, because that's where disaster strikes, right? And going back to my time in the Thunderbirds, we had to push the boundaries, and you'll, you'll, I'll play some tapes here you'll see in a little bit, where the normal algorithms inside our airplanes would give you warnings for slow airspeed. If you were getting slow, you'd hear a beeper that would tell you that, or a tone. And if you had too much of a dive angle and you were too close to the ground, you would hear a warning, warning, pull up, or low altitude. The challenge is that was built for the rest of the Air Force. But remember, we were asked to push a little more, go a little further, push the envelope, take a little more risk. So we had to fly, learn to fly through those warnings that we had learned to pay attention to all through our careers. And now as you get trained for an Air Force Thunderbird, the, the training is, Disregard those warnings that have meant so much to you for the last 15 years you've been flying. You've got to learn to fly through them. Oh, here's one other catch. Only the lead pilot looks outside. In these formation pictures that I'll show you, the, all the wing pilots fly off of the lead pilot. They stare at the lead exclusively. So now what you have to do is train your pilots, and they have to have enough trust and confidence in you as the leader to where... They're coming down the backside of a loop, and the tones in their headset are saying, warning, pull up, warning, pull up. And that's, that's the dynamic that we had to work through in terms of pushing boundaries on our end of the Thunderbirds in order to achieve our mission. So this notion that you've got to figure out where your boundaries are and figure out how you're going to advance them and push them a little farther than your competition is willing to, that's where the exceptional elite performance lies. And yet, if you do it callously, or if you do it incorrectly, you're out into that red circle where disaster strikes. So here's a good example of, I'll play a clip here of one of the videos that I'm, that I'm uh, or one of those tones that I'm talking about. This is what's called a five card loop. And we flew this loop, the, the video was coming from inside my cockpit. You can see the wing, the wing pilots out the side. And you'll hear some of the tones go off in the cockpit, and you'll hear some of, the, uh, some of the warning tones as well. So if we could play this clip, please, James. Reporting it there, five card ready now. Six. Uh, Six in. One. Ease and forward, left turn. Back, left, all the way. Ease and forward. Ready now, those coming up 420. Right on into four. There's four. End of the flight. On top at 65, 170. Back in with the pull. Stick it ready now. Three, four, six. Six in. Left turn. Back. So that's 
pushing the boundaries in a sense of a very physical realm that we were operating in, pushing the, pushing the physics, the boundaries of physics, right? I, tell, I like to tell people all the time when they're, when they're learning to fly, the laws of physics do not discriminate. They also have no sympathy and they also have no compassion. So when young kids learn to fly or old people learn to fly, it's really important that we teach them the laws of physics do not discriminate. They will punish you for pushing them outside the, outside the boundaries and the laws of aerodynamics. So, you know, one of the things in order to be able to push the boundaries and feel comfortable doing that, you need to be able to identify a fundamental set of skills that is critical to whatever your operating environment is. So when I came to EDS and I learned the sales role, we had these roles that were called pursuit leaders. And I, I loved it. I thought it was one of the, the, the best jobs ever. A pursuit leader takes, uh, own, owns no one. They, they, nobody reports to them. But they'll go in at the, at the start of a deal, and there might be a deal that's you know, five years and uh, a couple billion dollars in IT services, and it's their job to go win the deal. And so at, the, at, at their, at their skill set, they had some fundamental skills that were important to all salespeople, but it would surprise me at how sometimes these fundamental skills would be overlooked. The people that they had to have the skills at some point in their career to be successful, but you know what they are. They're basic skills like networking, like how do you have a conversation with a client, you know, inquisitive conversation, consultative selling, remembering names, going in with a, with a basic call plan. You're going in to meet with a client or a set of clients. What is the fundamental outcome from this meeting that you're hoping to get? To me, that's just fundamental for sales. And I was shocked over and over again how in our business, we, would be go we had worked for a couple of weeks to get this particular meeting with this particular client, and we're going in with three or four people to sit down and we're saying, okay, what is it that we're hoping to get out of this meeting? And the pursuit leader, a sales leader, you could tell they're sort of now making it up on the fly. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. You know, that's, like, that's fundamental, that's basics. So what are the fundamental skills that are required? And you know, they, they all differ. So, you know, if it depends, if you're, if you're an athlete, then sure, you've got to have some very fundamental skills on how you throw and catch and, you know, hit a baseball or whatever it is. But then at some point, the only way to get good at that fundamental skill is repetition over and over and over again. So I'll give you some examples here. Like in our role, a fundamental, a very fundamental task of something like this when you're uh, with the Thunderbirds is a flyby. And I don't know how many of you have seen the Thunderbirds or seen a flyby, but if you think about it, there's in front of an air show crowd, there's all these maneuvers that you do and they look pretty complicated and they are and they take a lot of practice. But a very fundamental basic is, can you take your airplane, fly by a funeral, a World Series, for example, um, the Super Bowl, and can you take the formation and be overhead a point on time on target, we call it. And we had, a, we had a plus or minus three seconds. Anywhere you went, you had to arrive plus or minus three seconds of when you said you would be there. So the fundamental skill of a flyby is an example. Well, the academy graduation. How many people have seen the Air Force Academy graduation where the cadets throw their hats up in the air and the jets come overhead, so they snap the picture. Basically, the Thunderbirds are photobombing the, the cadets as they throw their hats up. All it is is a flyby, right? So the couple days before that flyby, I went out by myself in my own jet, not with the formation or of being able to understand your airspeed and your timing and where you were headed on time, on target, plus or minus three seconds, was really critical. And for that fundamental skill, a lot of the rest of our skills would need to be built. When I was in Air Force pilot training, Back in the day that I went, for, if you wanted to fly fighters in the Air Force pilot training, you had to graduate within the top 20% or so of your, of your class. This was a time when attrition was, was pretty high in Air Force pilot training. And what I noticed was we'd see a lot of attrition in like the second week or so, you know, when people would start flying. And what would happen is they'd sit in the cockpit and they'd suddenly put on a helmet for the first time and they snap the mask up and it's very claustrophobic, they're hot, it's in Oklahoma, you got a long flight, long sleeve flight suit on, you're smelling JP8, you're smelling alcohol and rubber, you're really claustrophobic. 
And that can create some anxiety and some intensity, especially when you have an instructor just sitting there staring at you, watching you fumble through these buckles. And so um, what I did was I took my helmet home with me, and I would wear my helmet sitting around my apartment reading or um, mostly reading and studying for, for my classes for hours on end. Then I would take it to the simulator building, and I would sit in these mock-up trainers, and I would sit with my helmet on, with the mask up, smelling the rubber, smelling the alcohol, try, as much as I can trying to replicate the environment I was going to be in. And so when it came time, then I felt like I had just eliminated those simple things. You know, I can't tell you that doing that stuff made me a, a better pilot, but I can tell you that it didn't get in the way of that. And so many times when we skip over fundamental skills that we need for whatever it is we're trying to be successful at, those fundamental skills now just get in our way. We're tripping up on them as we're going into a very complicated meeting or a complicated um, sort of uh, negotiation. And so you just have to eliminate them. Take them out of play by removing them altogether. And so those fundamental skills, we would work on them in the Thunderbirds over and over and over again. To give you an, give you an idea, we would fly formation. Our typical routine would be we would depart on a Thursday for a show site. We would arrive at that show site and do a practice orientation. There were 25 different points that we would look at on any given show site. We'd do a little survey, maybe do a couple practice maneuvers, land, fly a Friday practice show there, go to some kind of PR event, fly Saturday, some kind of PR event, fly Sunday, usually Sunday night was off, fly home Monday, Tuesday fly a practice, and then Wednesday we would take off. Those fundamental skills that we had flying formation were so critical to us, we wouldn't go more than two days. And if we did, we would elevate our, we would elevate our, we'd raise our floors and we'd loosen up our formations. And so working those skills were so important to us. And here's a good example. I'll show you a video here of what was really just a pretty fundamental skill. If you do, if you, if there's any aerobatic pilots in the room here, all this is is your basic role. But now that fundamental skill of a basic role, you start ramping other people in there and put them an arm's length from you and you go down to within 200 feet of the water at 500 miles an hour. You can't afford, you cannot afford a mess up in the fundamental skill of an aileron role. So this is, um, James, if we can go to the next slide and play that video, please. Fort Lauderdale, by the way. Rolling left and rolling. Dive and ready now. Into the foot. Please. First one. Here's one boss. Back in with the pull. Switch. Come ready now. It's just a basic aileron roll. That really is what it is if there's any formation pilots in here. But to have any one of us in that formation sort of mess up the fundamentals of an aileron roll would be problematic. And what makes that maneuver especially difficult is we've got the entire formation in what's called trail, as you saw at the, at the start of it, where everybody's stacked on top of each other. And so at the start of that maneuver, when I call for nose coming up, everybody in the formation no matter what is happening, has to pull their nose up at the same rate at the same time. Anybody hesitates, anybody blinks, all these things have happened. If a bird comes through the formation, if a bird hits one of the other airplanes, if somebody gets an inadvertent firelight, you have to pull. No matter what, you have to pull on the nose coming up, right? Everybody in that formation is counting on you doing that. And so the the beauty of this formation and the more challenging things that we did relied on us understanding a very fundamental set of skills that we just got exceptional at and did every single time. The discipline to do it. 
So the next uh, thing I think when you're talking about elite performance and pushing boundaries is now that you've gotten good at your fundamental skills and you routinely do them, you have the discipline to keep your fundamental skills up, now you have to recognize what are your exceptional skills. Each of us have them. What are the exceptional skills that truly make you who you are and you better at some part of your job than anyone else's? This, I, I love this about watching uh, sports because if you look at baseball pitchers, for example, the aces on each of the team, none of them are alike. None of them tries to be the other guy. You know, The guy that throws the, the high heat doesn't try to be the guy that's painting the corners. Right? They, they all know that they bring different things, and how they got there was they understood a fundamental set of how to play baseball, sure, and how to field a grounder and cover behind home plate or whatever. Fundamentals, compulsories, right? But what truly made them professionals and unique is their, what they recognized was their true unique skill set. So this would come to play with us, and it, once we finally figured this out, we started doing much better in my old job in the IT industry. We were calling on the government to try to win a lot of government contracts. And we thought, well, we're dealing with the military, so when we go in there, we need to bring in people that look like them and you know, that they recognize. And certainly, there's some benefit to do that. But the problem was, we were trying to conform to what they knew of the world and knew of IT. But these people, they were DOD people, although they were very you know, buttoned down and, and short hair and all that, and very um, disciplined, they understood that the brightest IT minds didn't dress the way they dress. They didn't look like them. So one of the very fundamental things we did that helped us get more meetings and advance our cause was we just let our team be our team. We let our long-haired, tattooed people come in and call on senior officers in the military because the military was smart enough to know, I don't care, he doesn't, they don't need to look like me. I want to understand how, what, what advantage, what innovation they can bring me in IT. And it's amazing that that simple thing that we, we, would, we would sometimes go to a meeting and not allow the brightest guy in the room who thought of the technology we're trying to sell come before he wore a ponytail. We're afraid the military won't like it. And that was so, it was so silly of us, you know, because what we weren't accepting and allowing was that differentiating skill that separated us from everybody else. Now, the Thunderbirds, what differentiated us was we could perform the basics and the compulsories of a flyby, and you know, we could do the formation. Our differentiator in the air show business was really two things. We did it in closer proximity um, than, than other jet teams, or, or uh, other people, not necessarily other jet teams, but you know, other formation. We did it at higher speed, and we did more complex maneuvering. But our real true differentiator was our sequencing. So if you've ever thought about it, when your people have been to an air show, many people watch have been to an air show. If you've ever watched an air show, have you ever thought about you have all these airplanes coming into the same piece of sky at the same time, and somewhere in there, there's got to be a deconfliction plan. In fact, there's a case just a few weeks ago where this went tragically wrong out in Dallas, Texas. And I'm sure what they're going to find out is the deconfliction plan there either wasn't sophisticated enough or wasn't executed properly. But that deconfliction plan was really important to us. And what we would try to do is go from any one maneuver to the next maneuver, no more than 30 seconds from smoke off to smoke on. We wanted the crowd engaged the entire time they were there. And so to do that, when we were trying to design this kind of a cadence, which was really a kind of a cadence that really hadn't, hadn't been seen from uh, in, the, in the industry in a while, was we, we recognized that we had to be very good, each separate entity, me leading the diamond, the two solos each, at not just flying our maneuvers, that's compulsories, but you had to do it in a way that regardless of the crosswind or the sun angle or you're in a slow jet today or whatever the case is, you have to be overhead show center starting your maneuver plus or minus three seconds of when you said you would be, no matter what, every single maneuver for 32 minutes. And working that deconfliction, what I learned from that was it truly was a differentiator that people noticed. And the second thing was it made us so much better because we now had to get so good 
at recognizing our speeds, where the wind direction was coming from, what this particular show angle or show site or no-fly area was, that we had to get very precise in how we were setting up those maneuvers. And the collateral effect of that for us paid big advantages for us in the Thunderbirds. So that's what we really thought was our differentiator, is that sequencing and the timing that made our shows so exciting. So I'll play an example of a, um, this, we'll, we'll play this here. This is a takeoff maneuver, which gives you an idea of um, the proximity of this takeoff. You're gonna be watching from the number four, which they call the slot, and right after takeoff, he'll maneuver his uh, aircraft um, right, right underneath mine. So let's play the video, please. Fire set. This is true. Nose wheels. Gear now. Gear now. Focus on four. Right turn. Four set. One. Easy forward. Left turn. Continuous left turn. Burners out. Ready now. As low. So I think the next thing to talk about, the compulsories, the understanding what makes you unique, and for each of us it's different. In, in my job now, I do it different than the guy in front of me because I just have skills that he didn't have. He had skills that I didn't have. The worst thing for me to do would be to come in and try to be him. It had to, it had to modify to what I know I do well. So let's go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, that one, thank you. So. Um, I think the next thing is, if you're going to talk about elite performance, you've really got to understand the collateral team, the next phase of the team that's really critical to your success. So understanding each of those people or each of those organizations and how they touch you and the thing that you're trying to get done. And most importantly, I think this is the hardest thing to do, is to try to understand what's going to make them successful. And so if you can start the conversation out with, how do I make you successful today? What is it that you're looking for to achieve? Do you need notoriety in front of your boss? Do you need a certain financial on some part of the deal? Do you need some client? Do you need some networking? You want to get some kind of product in on this deal? Let's put it out on the table and figure out, how is this going to make you successful? And then figuring out that extended team and what's critical to them to help make their success to me is so critical. We had a, one of our best pursuit leaders came in to lead this, uh, one of the largest deals that we were ever gonna go after. It was, um, it was a state IT services deal for the entire state. I wanna say it was worth about 10 billion. They called him in, he came in from Colorado and he's starting the briefing to our senior executives, the most senior, our CEO, president of our division. And so the, the president of the division thought they'd push back on him a little bit, maybe squeeze him a little, put some pressure on him. And they said at the very start of the briefing, the president said, you know what, this deal kind of smells to me. I didn't like it from the start, and I'm not sure that I'm ever going to like this deal. So I thought, this is kind of interesting. How's he going to handle this? And our pursuit leader, pretty young guy, he's in his early 30s, but had already had a couple big deals in his belt. He pushes back from the table, and he says, let's bail out. I'm not in. You guys, if you guys aren't in on this deal, because this deal is hard, it's going to be difficult to win, and I'm not going to come back here every single time and deal with the doubts about it. We're either all in on this deal, or I'll go back to the slopes in Colorado. And I thought, man, what a gutsy thing to do. And there was quiet in the room, and so, you know, the president saved a little face and said something like, well, let's just continue on with the briefing and see how it looks. But never again did he receive that kind of treatment when he brought a challenging deal. And I thought, man, that's a person, that's why he was so good at his job. That's a person who knew the collateral support that he was, was needed for success, and he wasn't willing to put the effort in behind it. He wasn't going to waste his effort on the, the support that he knew he had to have to get the deal done. Learned a lot from that meeting. In the Thunderbirds, for example, you know, you, you probably know and you've seen the six pilots and the, and the jets that fly. 
but you probably aren't aware of the 120 people behind the scenes that make the whole operation run. So my boss, uh, my wing commander at, uh, when I was at Nellis, he was, uh, he had, they had renovated his conference room and he reached out to all his organizations and he said, I want a picture from each of you to hang in the conference room that kind of states, you know, who, what your mission is, what you're about. And so I brought him this, whoops, I think I went uh, forward, there we go. I brought him this picture right here <laughs> for the Thunderbirds. And he looked at it and he was shocked, you know, he thought, it would be the Delta formation over Mount Rushmore or, you know, some iconic, you know, uh, American theme. But I said, you know, you asked me what the Thunderbirds are about, what we represent. It's this right here. This is what we would call phase inspection of a jet. Every so often, a jet has to go through a serious inspection like this every so many hours. And in the Thunderbirds, we had fewer team, fewer team members assigned to phase. We did our own phase, which was unusual. And we had only a few members assigned to the team. Maybe, I think, two or three were on the phase team. But if you count the number of people that are working on that aircraft, I think it's something like 10 or 11. I can't remember exactly how many. And some of them that I see in there, because this was from my team, or work in the administrative section. Some of them were HR. And this picture made me so proud because it was just a, it was just a you know, moment in time. We set records in the Air Force for how fast we could put a jet through phase maintenance and the quality on the backside in terms of quality control. And so when a jet would come through phase, the entire organization knew that, hey, if we don't have jets to fly, there, there is no Thunderbirds, right? So we need these jets out of maintenance and actually on the line producing pilots and flying air shows. So it was all hands on deck. People would come from all parts of the organization and they would do whatever they could. Hand somebody a tool, bring them lunch, it didn't matter, they would find some reason to help participate if they had the time available to help get a jet through phase. And that to me said more about what made us successful as a team, the Thunderbirds, than, than the formation. Because without that, the formation never gets to fly over Mount Rushmore. So understanding those critical people and how you need to involve them to be part of your success to me is very much a part of elite performance at our level, at the level that you're working. You can't do it solo. You've got to understand the different touch points and what's critical to them. So then the, the, uh, the final point I would bring is um, uh, accountability. If you truly want to operate as an elite performer, you have to figure out a way to be accountable to the standards you set. The, sta the, the standards that are going to make sure you have the discipline to be good at your fundamentals and make sure that you're accelerating the things that make you unique, figuring out more and more of those and getting better and better at that thing that nobody else can do as well as you can. And so to be accountable, to, you, you cannot do that by yourself. I don't care how objective you are, there's research after research that shows we are so biased and I, I do this whenever I give a, a seminar on uh, pilots, right? I'll say, raise your hand if you're a below average pilot, right? Nobody will raise their hand. Fine, you don't want to be embarrassed, just, you know, mentally, if you're a below average pilot, think about it. Nobody's thinking about it, okay? Statistically, that can't possibly be the case, right? Statistically, half of us in this room are below average pilots. And it just makes the point that we are really bad as humans at assessing ourselves. So if you want to get good at something, you have to have some kind of objective view of somebody looking at your performance that has honest and candid conversations with you about the standards you're living to and whether or not you're meeting them. In the Thunderbirds, every maneuver we did, we would score it. We had somebody on the ground scoring it, one through 10. And then at the end of that, we would aggregate the maneuver scores and have an overall uh, air show performance score. And our average was about a seven. Occasionally, you know, later, early in the show season, we were hitting around four or five. By the time the show season ended, we were typically up around seven. And we would debrief, so it's a 30 minute flight for the performance. And after the performance, we would come inside the room and hold a debrief, and that debrief would usually last for about an hour and a half. If you want to get truly exceptional at something, You've got to have that kind of attention to detail in your performance, both the fundamentals of what you're doing and the, the, the true unique things that make you successful. 
So I want to show you this one last clip to give you an idea of uh, the environment we were working in. It's the next slide, please. This is over Atlantic City. And this is uh, one of our solo pilots who's going to flip uh, upside down and fly over Atlantic City at about, uh, I think he's at about 150 feet. He can go down as low as 75 feet. Now remember, when you're flying, when you roll upside down, your controls are reversed. Typically, if you're flying, you pull back on the stick to climb and you push back to descend. But when you're inverted, that's reversed. You push forward to climb. At the speed he's flying, which is about 500 miles an hour at about 150 feet off the water, if he forgets that for a fraction of a second, it's a mistake he'll never know he made, right? So the fundamentals, it goes back to the fundamentals and the discipline, and just keep in mind that when he's doing that, he's got to be over, over head of the show center perfectly inverted, plus or minus three seconds of when he said he would be. So let's play the uh, tape, please. Fire up. Continuous race for the dive and test review. Two. Go fire up. Altitude. Little more So back to the pushing boundaries discussion. Um, one day I'm watching his tape because as the commander, it was part of my job to be the exempt objective guy that was looking at the different performances and helping assess them and making sure we're playing within the rules. And I'm um, watching his tape one time and he's inverted and he put, puts his hand up and starts fiddling with something on his canopy. You know, of course it's down here because he's inverted, but he's fiddling with something on his canopy. And I stop and I call him in, say, you are 150 feet inverted at 500 miles an hour. What are you doing? And he says, it was a bug on my canopy. It was just really kind of bothering me. I said, well, let me tell you what's bothering me. <laughs> you know? And it was a case where we had gotten so used to pushing those boundaries and disregarding the airspeed limitations and the warnings and all that, that he had just become callous to the risk that he was taking over and over again. And that's kind of the last thought that I'll leave you with is that when you, when you are willing to push the boundaries like that and you have the right mindset and the support and the things we talked about, now you've got to have that objective measure, that accountability, where somebody's going to help you step back and say, this is too far. You're pushing too far here. You're taking too much risk and, and help you back up a little bit. That is a part of being an elite performer is knowing when you're going too far over the edge and you've got to step back just a little bit. So those are some things that helped make us uh, successful in the uh, Air Force Thunderbirds. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you have a good rest of your uh, conference today. Thanks for having me. Richard, Richard, I'm, would you indulge us? Does anybody in the audience have a question that they'd like to ask, Richard? I'd like to know how freaking exhausted are you after 32 minutes of full-blown concentration at 500 knots in close proximity to $150 million worth of jets, and oh, by the way, 100,000 people on the ground, but they don't really count, right? Because you can't see their faces because you're going past them so fast. <laughs> yeah. How exhausted are you after a, a, a yeah, show performance? It was, like a great, it was a great exhaustion. It was. It was 32 minutes. We tried to, you know, that deconfliction thing I was talking about, plus or minus three seconds. We, tried, we set a goal to try to do a whole air show in under 30 minutes, and uh, we never did. I think we got 31 minutes and change. But um, it's one of the best things about it was you weren't really thinking about your checking account or some kind of issue with, you know. <laughs> It was, it was, there was a lot of focus in that 32 minutes. Well, that's one of the things that we talked about yesterday at the event uh, over at Banyan was that uh, one of the great joys that I get from flying is that I love you guys dearly, but I don't think one bit about you. Well, I'm thinking about from my spinner to my tail. I'm thinking about the safety and comfort of my passengers, and I'm thinking about the performance of the vehicle that I'm operating at the time, much like we do when we're at a boat show much like we do when we're in front of a client trying to get a deal going, is we're focused. Our attention, if you're focused on that and you've got a plan for success, chances are good you're going to execute. You're going to execute that plan and you're going to come out with a successful outcome. And if you go into it unprepared, if you go into it with other things on your mind, you may, may not be doing 500 knots, 150 feet off the ground inverted. 
but it's not going to end well for you. That's exactly right. We've got a question. So when you were flying, you seemed to have like a specific cadence and the, the way that you were talking. Did, did do all the other pilots talk in that same cadence or was that just specific to you? And um, yeah. Oh, second part of the question. Yeah. Um, what do you think of Top Gun Maverick? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll take the second part first. I loved it. I thought it was so much, but just suspend reality, right? It's just fun. It's just fun. I loved it. I loved the first one, too. I thought they were both great. Um, this first part of your question, uh, no, a really quick funny story is when I, I, when I led, became the leader of the Thunderbirds, I was also for the first time a commander, a military commander. And I thought, not knowing anything about it, because I never flew for the team before they hired me to come in and lead it, was I thought, well, I'm a commander, and uh, commanders bark orders. That's what commanders do. You know? So we'd start flying, and I had a really sharp, choppy kind of a cadence uh, to my call. And um, one of the experienced wingmen pulled me aside and goes, you know, boss, that's not, that's not really working. You know? um, let me explain to you how intense it is there, what's going through our mind, and this and that. We just really need you to take it easy. You know? And uh, so I just learned through that two things. One, they would, if I was going to be effective as a commander, as basic as this seems, uh, I had to learn it, then I needed to communicate in a way that motivated them that meant something to them, not the way that, you know, I was looking at it from the wrong angle. And so, yeah, you do that on purpose, and it's a very, cal it's a very deliberate way you do it. It's a very calming way, and it really you're communicating to the team, everything's fine here. We're just flying along and, you know, doing our rolls and loops, and you're also trying to establish a cadence in that where they can get used to pulling at the right times or pushing the throttle up at the right time, which is really... Predictability is really, really important when you're that close to each other. Sometimes you're as close as 18 inches from each other, and they're not looking outside, right? So it's, predictability is very important to them. So that's what I was trying to do there. Richard, I, I was fortunate enough to watch one of your presentations several years ago, and I'll never forget you made a statement, something like, if today's not your day. And the point you were making is you always told your airmen, if I got this right, you know, let's say you're doing your pre-flight, something's not right, or you're, you're taxiing and you just didn't hear the tower, or there's, you know, like the third time yeah. something like that happens, you never got onto them, you know, just put the plane away. Maybe it's not your day to fly or something like that. I thought it was yeah. fascinating. Yeah, we had a three strikes rule. So if you, ha if you made three small mistakes that by themselves weren't big mistakes, but they indicated that, you know, your head just wasn't fully in the game, maybe you called the wrong altimeter setting or maybe I would call the wrong maneuver. There was all kind of safeguards to make sure I wouldn't do the wrong maneuver. But let let's say I called it you know, it would be like a mental mistake, like, you know, where's his head, right? And then if after we had three of those, and this happened probably four or five times in my tenure there, then we would say, you know what, spread it out. And that was our, we had different formations. You could come tight, it was close formation. We had loose, which was when we'd go loose, we'd go about three feet uh, from each other. And then uh, we could go spread it out. And we'd just go spread it out, which basically was saying, Everybody just get away from each other. You know, let's just <laughs> safe it up. Let's just go home. Today's not our day. Awesome. Richard, thank you very much. I'm going to encourage all of you to keep your seats. <laughs> Richard, stay on the stage if you don't mind. I need your help with something.